Welcome to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob, where you'll hear highly accomplished and fascinating guests talk about the challenges they've overcome and the winning mindsets that have led them to great success. And now your host, Dr. Bob. Welcome to another episode in Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. If you've seen my podcast before, you know that I choose my guests very carefully. Each guest started from very modest beginnings. They're often from a poor or lower middle class family, but through hard work, energy, and perseverance, became successful, productive citizens. Each one is proof that our free enterprise system works because it offers opportunity and upward mobility to everyone, but you got to be willing to put in the effort to succeed. Well, Brian Marriott, my guest today, fits that criteria to a T. Brian learned about hard work and responsibility at an early age. When he was 15, he worked at a local kennel, which meant not only feeding the dogs, but also cleaning up after them. He also worked as a dishwasher and busboy in a restaurant chain and became a cook, server, and ultimately an assistant manager. Despite a heavy course load at college, he always had a job to help pay his tuition, and after college, he even did a stint on an overnight janitorial crew to help pay off his student loans. After graduating college, Brian worked in investment banking for over 25 years and then decided to get involved in politics. In 2016, he was elected to a seat in the city council of San Juan Capistrano, a beautiful small city of 35,000 people located in Orange County in Southern California. And in 2018, he became mayor of that city. But Brian wants to do even more for his community and for his country. He's now running as a Republican for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing California's 49th district. And he's here today to discuss his campaign. Brian, welcome to the show. Dr. Bob, nice to be with you. Brian, first, I want to congratulate you on your career from working in a kennel to become, becoming mayor of a fine city. That's an American success story. And in my view, your work at that kennel is one of the most important experiences that, that you have because it gave you the experience that you'll need for your next challenge, which is cleaning up the shit in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Let's talk about your upcoming race for the House seat. You're on the ballot for the primary, which will be held in June, just a uh, month away. And according to the rules in California, if you're one of the top two vote getters, then, then you will be on the ballot for the general election in November 8th of this year. Looking at the other candidates, there are four other Republicans on the primary ballot. Lisa Bartlett, Josiah O'Neill, Chris Rodriguez, and Renee Taylor. In recent polls, you lead all of them in fundraising, which, as we all know, is crucial to win in any political contest. And as of April 15th, that's the most recent data I have, you lead all of the other Republican candidates combined in fundraising with a nice uh, war chest of $2 million dollars which is only a bit below uh, what uh, Mike Levin has in his war chest, and he's the incumbent who won the seat and held it since 2019. So bottom line, the race is going to be between you and Mike Levin. You're in against him for the same seat uh, in 2020, but you lost not by much, 47% to his 53. Why do you think you can win this time? Well, and, and thank you for having me. Really a treat to be here with you, Dr. Bob. So when you look at the 49th Congressional District, and to give your viewers some, some context, starts down here in the Del Mar area, runs all the way up through the big population centers, Vista, Carlsbad, Oceanside, and up through southern Orange County, encompassing my city of San Juan Capistrano, which you described beautifully, by mm -hmm. the way. You can ride your horse through town if you choose. All the way up now with redistricting through Laguna Niguel. So it's a fantastic and a beautiful district. If you look at the history, Daryl Issa, after repping the district for 18 years, in his, I presume it'll be his first retirement from Congress because he'll retire from the 50th someday. When he stepped away in 2018, the Republican, a big name Republican at the time, our biggest name Republican female in the, in the state, just a tough race for her. She got beat about 13% by Mike mm -hmm. Levin in that race. 
And people said there would never be another Republican in the seat. And we had dipped our toe in that primary. And I knew differently. I knew that it was a district that was full of common sense people. And this hard left nonsense that Mike represents was not going to be for them. So we set about the task. We cleared the field in the last cycle. Very grassroots oriented campaign. When you're trying to unseat a freshman, somebody who's a not, who is not a good fit for the district, You've got to educate people on what he stands for and help them contrast that with their beliefs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we just couldn't get enough of it done. Now, everybody dealt with COVID, no excuses. Yeah, yeah. But for our style of campaign, it was particularly tough. We had a very tough cycle for Republicans. Trump lost the district pretty badly. And when the dust settled on a 47% number, we said, you know what? Let's just go finish the job. The hell with redistricting. We'll see where that lands. But let's just get back to work and finish the job. And that's what we've done. In the meantime, they did some redistricting. It's not a massive change, but they added Laguna Niguel to the district, which is an 80,000-plus city that leans right and is has a meaningful Republican registration advantage. Peeled a few of the precincts away down this way. And we ended up with about a 1.3% Democrat registration advantage versus the prior 3%. So it was a meaningful difference. The race is a toss-up race. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you how we're going to win and why we're the team to win, Dr. Bob. There are six categories of campaign work that are crucial. Fundraising, field work, theme and messaging, social media, operations, and I'm forgetting one, but it's... Getting out the vote. Yeah, and getting out the vote, which is part of your operations for sure. And coalition building is the sixth. And you've got to, to beat an incumbent, you've got to be not just good, not even great. You might, you might be great at four of them and win an open seat, but to unseat a two-term incumbent, you've got to be great to exceptional at all six of them. And the only way you do that is to continue to build it and grow it and make it happen, just like turning a business division around. Well, we turn the district around prove this race winnable for Republicans, within a few weeks, the NRCC came in and targeted the seat to be one in 22. And that's because of what we had done to change the perception of the seat. So we're the best team and the best candidate to keep plowing forward and finish the job. And that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to explore uh, your position versus Mm -hmm. the positions of uh, Levin. Uh, Let's go through a few of the different topics and feel free to bring up other ones. But like critical race theory is a big issue these days. The woke has made this an an extremely important issue that uh, America is inherently racist and can't uh, can't be turned around and or must be abolished. We must destroy the country, essentially. So what is his position on critical race theory and what is yours? Well, Mike's position on critical race theory would be everything that the progressive movement stands for around the issue. That's his rhetoric. You know, so far there isn't a major critical race theory vote in Congress. There's a couple around the edges, but his rhetoric, the way where he places his political muscle and and his and his words is squarely in that progressive movement corner. He's Mm -hmm. part of the progressive movement. He's he is politically as an operative, I would say he's kind of the head of the snake for it in Southern California. I mean, he's he's right, very determined to impact politics locally. And that's their thing. I mean, that's that's the that critical race theory is part of what they're all about in the school system. It's the emotional button. They're just mm-hmm. going to keep pushing. If mm-hmm. you go on the California Teachers Association and you go on their website, you will be shocked. Your viewers will be shocked. You would expect to find stuff about benefits and what they're striving for in terms of what the California teachers want to get a shortened work week or what, whatever. I don't begrudge them any of their, their dreams or what they'd like to see happen in the school system to benefit the role they play and so forth. 90% of their website is about social engineering through our public schools. It's really quite remarkable. Critical race theory, to my eye, is poisonous, absolutely poisonous. I don't know about your children. I know that mine have never come home from school talking about their black friend or their Asian American friend or anything. Race doesn't, I don't, they don't even seem conscious of it. The pot has melted and the progressive movement in the left, the hard left, will not accept that. They will not let it melt. Mm-hmm. I believe as a country... We had we, there's certainly some things in our history that that you know that we that we feel badly about and 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 can be ashamed of. But I think after 1964, 
we largely leveled the playing field, right? Which is all government can do is, is statutorily level the playing field Correct. so everybody has equal opportunity. Equal opportunity, not equal outcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. You put into life what you, you know, you get out of life what you put into mm -hmm. it. I mean, we've taken the main obstacles and kind of, you know, flattened the playing field and, and, and the template for success, if you will. So now we're going to pound in these kids' head the notion that race is everything. And most people don't realize it, but critical race theory goes back decades in its formulation and, 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 its, and, and the extent of some of the theory. People are talking about it now with some sense of it, and we know that it's in the background of doing away with advanced placement courses and, and other challenging courses and things that have got people upset. But we just, let's hope it's a fad. I mean, let's, let's just hope that we can move forward as a country because I don't think people who are not, who, who, who classify as, as minorities, okay? What, what, whatever the distinction is that classifies them as a minority, I don't think they benefit in any way. And I think kids in particular, that's got to screw with their head. The idea that if they do make it, they're making it because somebody's going out of their way to help them make it, even though they may sense that the playing field is already is already level. Our, mm -hmm. our kids are smart today. You know, they're, they're perceptive, they're intuitive, and, and I think it's poisonous for them. And that, that will be reflected in my voting record should it come into my realm. Now, as it plays into education, I'm a very strong believer in local education, ground up with education. I'm not a fan of federal dollars, you know, no child left behind, reach for the sky, all that stuff was a waste of hundreds of billions of dollars. Teachers and parents will tell you that. I, the federal government, other than some of the title stuff, which was necessary early on, you know, um, stay the hell out of education. Let it, let it, let it be at the grassroots level. The grassroots level. I don't level. think Americans, uh, American students are rating any higher now that we have a Department of Education that I think that Jimmy Carter put in place than we were then. So this an enormous bureaucracy called the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many billions of dollars, but it has to be 50, 100, 100, 200 billion dollars a year that's being spent and not wisely, not doing the job. I know the schools in California, we pay the highest taxes in the country, but the schools here rate, I think, the bottom two or three in the country on education for students. That, that, that's correct. It's at least somewhere around 40. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it's and, and there's, you know, there's some variety in, in regions and, and there's some pockets of excellence and all of that. And there's just like there's excellent teachers out there and excellent administrators out there. But the system as a whole is failing kids Corrupt. when you put it together cumulatively. Mm -hmm. And none of this stuff is helping. None of it is helping. I don't, you know, people... People want to, be, I, think, I think kids want to be challenged. They want to excel. And, and parents want their kids to be able to excel to the extent that they're able to. But let's keep it local. One of the things, as far as the shutdowns, parents who had access to their school districts could go in, you know, speak their mind for three minutes and impact things. Mm -hmm. At the state level, you don't have that. Nobody could go in and, and shout at Governor Newsom for three minutes. The forum for that doesn't exist. We flipped a school board in San Francisco. And nobody ever thought that could happen, Excellent. right? Excellent. Booted step. out the leftists, if you will, right? And, and the big government, you know, teaching establishment folks and, and turn that whole board over. That's because of energy at the grassroots level. So I, 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 I'm a little worried that, that you know, re Republicans will, will, won't be able to resist the temptation of some federal answers to education mm -hmm. issues. But, but I think education will be okay if we focus on educating kids, not trying to raise them. And some of these issues are parenting issues. Raising is the job of the parents. That's right. Education is the job of Absolutely. the schools. Now, uh, talk to me about the right of, ki of parents to decide what kids learn in school. I mean, it, I would think it's common sense that parents, what parents want their children to learn, and they should be vocal about that. But uh, more recently, the administration uh, has uh, targeted uh, parents who show up at teachers' meetings, uh, at uh, bo uh, board meetings for the uh, for the school boards, and called them domestic terrorists mm -hmm. for being for wanting to be involved in their children's education. Shameful. Everything about it was shameful, and and arresting some of this, parents, arresting yeah. people. Yeah, this is well. This kind of grew out of the shutdowns, right? All of a sudden, parents were seeing the content that kids were being taught. Right. I was our, our kids are in private. I was I was surprised with some of the stuff around the time of the riots that they had the kids reading, you know, poems about cops. And I, honestly, I you know even in a private school, even in a private school. So so mm -hmm. parents. 
parents would like to think that they can turn the that they can you know count on the school districts to to teach teach things the right way teach the basics drill down on the basics inspire and motivate their kids academically not on the social experimentation course, stuff but course. academically but they can't that not not anymore in society mm-hmm. this 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 has gone too far now you can see that the public school establishment wants to dig in deep with this stuff right. now doing I don't, away with merit doing away with merit right if they had their way completely just like with the teachers mm-hmm. i mean they did away with it with, with merit you know a couple of decades ago mm-hmm. and so now the next thing would be for the kids right. and ultimately that's i don't think that's what people want for the their dumbing children. down why, of our society absolutely mm-hmm. why would you ever want your kids to accomplish less than their natural abilities and the determination yeah, because, equals them because, being able to Well, you to might do. want them to uh, uh, accomplish less because if they accomplish more, it'll hurt the feelings of somebody else. Unbelievable. Right? Hurting feelings yeah. has become so important. I don't remember when I grew up, it, you know, we had an expression when somebody you know, try to make you feel bad. Sticks and stones will break mm-hmm. my bones, but names, names will never, never hurt me. me. Yeah. What happened to that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Happened. What happened to that? Now, oh, names and name calling, whatever. Oh, it's a very hurtful. And it's a, uh, it, it, it's an unpleasant environment. And uh, I got to report you to the principal. So we're in trouble in the schools. And the only good thing that came out of COVID in the shutdowns is what you're talking about. The yeah. parents saw what the kids were learning and are objecting to it. We well, you know it was what I stealth. Think. It was stealth. Yeah. You, you know what I think? And and very few silver linings with COVID. Very few. I mean, we learned how quickly we can make vaccines when we put our minds to it. That might that you know, that might mean something quite dramatic down the road. Who knows? You know, we've kind of laid a little bit of a blueprint for that. Very few silver linings. But one of them I would suggest is that parents recognize what's going on in 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 the school districts and kids, we want kids to be on campus, but I was a little surprised to see the effectiveness of some of the technology for delivery of content. Mm -hmm. And where I think that could play in a little bit is we may see more startups because of that. We may see for profit education. We may see the idea that it's 2022 Mm -hmm. and kids have to go to a government run school that's determined by their zip code completely archaic when you really think about it. Mm -hmm. So the best thing for the public school system, because we need good public schools, we're always going to be dependent on public schools. Mm -hmm. It's baked into our financing system with property taxes and everything else. So we need good public schools. But I think that the the best thing for public schools and what offers the most hope is competition. If you've ever seen the numbers, Dr. School choice is what it's all about. We have choices in everything in America. Mm -hmm. You have choices of what kind of car, what kind of dish soap, what kind of deodorant. You should have a decision about where to send your kid to school. Absolutely right. Right? It has to be in the same state, I suppose. Sure. Uh, But other than that, and that would make the schools compete. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and teach what the parents want them to teach. Mm-hmm. And in 59 years of life, I have never seen competition make any company, any, any worse. agency or anything right. worse. That's right. Always, it, you, if Always. you've ever seen the, the studies about charter schools, there's all the hysteria. We're going to lose public schools, going to lose registration, lose kids, lose funding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of responding to that, like we would do in the business world, right. we spent a lot of years in management. If you had competition to deal with, you dealt with it, right? And you repriced and you, You'd you say, know, you downsized. What is the charter you school doing do. better? Let's do that. Right. So what they see from studies now mm-hmm. is in these in these districts, which with a strong commitment to charter schools, the numbers are improving in the public schools, in the I pure pu- the conventional I public see. schools. Nobody claimed to expect that, but it makes perfect mm-hmm. sense because mm-hmm. they were forced to compete. A monopoly is never a good thing, right? Absolutely right. Yeah. Never a good thing. Yep. And uh, the technology we have now of, of uh, learning at home, learning on the web, I think is extremely useful at the college level. Mm-hmm. There's no reason why kids have to get up, uh, you know, kids in college have to get up at seven in the morning, trudge through the snow if you're in, uh, if you're in Wisconsin mm-hmm. or whatever, and sit in a classroom and be given a lecture by a graduate student because the professors don't want to teach mm-hmm. junior, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the low-level classes, when indeed 
because of the web, you could tune in and see the best lecturer in the world mm -hmm. who could even be dead by that time yeah. teaching you calculus. And mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to you know, listen so carefully and, and, and worry about, can I take notes at the same time? You could pause it. It's miraculous. And I think, and I was, as you may know, I was a college professor. All right. I didn't know that. Yeah, I was I knew a college your business professor. history. I didn't know right. that. Yeah. yeah, I was a professor at Tufts University, then a mm. lecturer at, uh, at MIT. And uh, when my kids came of age, they were graduating high school, I said, college is a waste of time for most people. Mm. And the proof of this is the most successful people in the world, the wealthiest people, I'll define success as wealth, mm. it, though there are other kinds of success, the most successful people in the world never finished college. Mm. Steve Jobs dropped out of Reed yeah. College. I think he took so a few courses. Bill Gates, Bill Gates didn't finish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Harvard. They were anxious uh, to deploy their Zuckerberg brilliance. Zuckerberg figured it out, yeah. dropped out of Harvard. And then there's a Michael Dell, dropped out of the University of Chicago. Well, you know, so college is a waste of time time and a waste of resource and now of course there are there are certain things you have to go to college to mm. learn no, there's no question i'm not saying in every case but in most cases for most students it turns out to be a place where it's better drugs and better alcohol mm -hmm. and that's what college education has come down <laughs> yeah. to for them and the rate of increase of the expense of a college education mm -hmm. has outpaced even the cost of medical care, which is through right. the roof, all right? And yeah. there's no justification None. of this. And the reason this came about is guaranteed because students. guaranteed loans yeah. by the government. Yeah. So the colleges say, open the doors, let people in, right? And yeah. whatever you want to take, you want to take a course in the history of uh, the uh, American uh, the indigenous people uh, for yeah. which you'll never be able to get a job. And now they're sitting on billion-dollar endowments in so many of these yeah. schools. They're and, sitting on huge endowments, yeah. and the government is paying the freight. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's a mafia enterprise. Most universities should be shut down, and I think that... The that getting away from bricks and mortar is the way it's going to happen. Well, I do think we'll see change. I mean, Purdue is, there's, there are a few examples of institutions that have been an exception to the wild run up and f nine, 10, 11 times the average rate of inflation, of mm. conventional yep. inflation. Yep. You, you're absolutely right on that. And hard to understand how that could possibly happen, right? Until you go and you figure out, well, you throw all this revenue at something and, and that's what's going to happen, money. right? But Purdue has a three-year program. They have, you know, so they have an increased oh. tuition in, a, in 11 or 12 years. Creativity. Who is the campus run by? I believe he's a former business executive mm -hmm. of a Fortune 500 company. Uh, I'll send you something on it if I think of it. But, but so, so hopefully some of this awareness mm -hmm. around the failure relative to the, to the level of debt and expectation that's going on with 20-somethings today will help the industry, for lack of a better way to put it, of higher education, figure out some, some creative ideas, you know, for how to, to modify the expense a little bit and how to, I mean, kids are taking some courses that they took in high school. When I, when I went to high school, your GPA, I think you, the max you could have was a three or something or whatever, you know. And now these kids, they take the AP classes and they got 4.3s and 4.5s and they still can't get into USC. You know, we got a bunch of them around the campaign and stuff and they're all competing with four pluses GPAs and stuff. So then they get to a college campus and they take some of the same courses over again. Yeah, well, the, you know? the answer really is the web because you wouldn't have to limit how many students. You right. don't have to limit it to the size right. of your classroom. Right. It's absurd to right. limit it to the size of a classroom. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, so, that, and it opens it up to everyone. Like, right. I was a lousy student in high school, mm. okay? So I had trouble getting into college. So a whole nother story. But if it's all on the web and mm. you're not taking up a seat in, the, in a brick and mortar, you would let everyone in. Everyone can take every yeah. course. You have to take exams to get a degree, but... Why would you place any limits on anybody? Yeah, and I think that's back to the silver lining piece. We, we might see more innovation in education, in education. both in K-12 through and, and hopefully in the mm -hmm. university and college system, uh, because there's, there's definitely a disconnect. We, I still do some financial planning. We have a nonprofit where we try to deliver some investment and in financial acumen in lower income areas. Because as, as a regional management executive, I was part of all these initiatives where you know we would target, for lack of a better way, put the the super high net worth 
the ultra high net worth, we called it, then the mass affluent, we called it. Well, none of these major corporations on Wall Street ever had programs to try to target, you know, modest to very low yeah. income, right? I Normal mean, you could people. bump into an IRA pamphlet in a branch, you know, yeah. Yeah, but maybe. ultimately that, that doesn't happen so often, you know. But none of these kids, a lot of these kids are not going through any kind of planning process, any kind of evaluation process at all. So that's something we build into our curriculum. But I'm excited about the path forward for education. I don't, I just, to me, it's, it's not a federal responsibility. There, the, some of the equal education around the title stuff w was helpful at the time, and I think mostly the 70s. Some of the distribution of those funds are, are not good now. It's, it's, it's lumpy. It's, 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 it's not matching the requirements and stuff. They would actually be better to get that part of it out to the states too. But, but I think we're going to see some innovation in education that's going to be exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm hopeful for that. Mm -hmm. and, and Levin, by, by comparison, it's all about the public school system. It's all about mm -hmm. the teachers' union. He takes a ton of money from them. He's, he's part of influencing where some of their money goes. Um, it's, it's that progressive movement, government, government, government. The bigger, the better. The bigger answers, the better. Mm -hmm. And we are lumping layers on top of layers. That's why we got 30-plus trillion in debt. And the trend now is in schools to not measure things, right? You're not right. going to have um, uh, a valedictorian who usually was the right. smartest guy or girl in, in the high school would right. give the, uh, a lecture. No, you can't have a valedictorian anymore. You can't have honor society anymore. You can't have uh, high um, uh, uh, advanced courses anymore. Um, and and I don't think kids want that. I don't think the kids who never, I never had any hope of being valedictorian when I was in high school and college. Right. And, and I had never a problem, but, but I wasn't. But I didn't have a problem. Right. I right. didn't want to, I didn't want to done away with. It didn't make me feel bad. Yeah. No, no. But I, I knew I wasn't as smart right. or as capable. D so what? Give it a second thought. Right. So Let's this, and, and many universities are doing away now with the uh, SAT and achievement test scores. Yeah. So how are they going to choose people? By the color of their skin is how they're going to choose people. Yeah. You know, not by the content of their character, as Martin Luther King said. Right. All right, moving on. There's an, uh, here's a tough question for you. I'm, you know, I just... We take the tough ones, yeah, too, Dr. Bob. You got you to, <laughs> you know, and if you can't answer it, maybe we'll edit the tape or something. Yeah. But <laughs> how many genders are there, Brian? How many genders? How many There's genders? Gee, I, you know, that, that seems contradictory to what I keep on reading in the news, that there, mm. there are many different genders. And uh, I don't know where people come up with this. It's the left has gone so far to the left that uh, it's not on the map anymore. Yeah, that, and I'm not even sure if we define it as, as leftism. I, I think it's, we define it as... Wokeism. Fi wokeism, yeah. find, finding a way to push an emotional button. Mm -hmm. I think it's... I, I, I'm very empathetic to anybody who, who struggles with two, true you know, gender dysphoria. It's just but having you know, struggled it's rare. being confident you know, the, and, and, right. you know, and comfortable in their gender. And, 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 but the idea that... It's the school district's job to teach you or to, to open up the question, even in yeah. primary school, yeah. to raise the question, uh, Jimmy, how do you know you're a boy? Why do you think you're a boy? Yeah. Maybe you're not. This, to me, is also poisonous. And, and, to, and to put a wall up for school districts, and this is going on in some spots around the country, where they're looking to put a, a, a wall up between parent and child on this stuff. I've heard the stories. Yeah. And this is, I mean, kids can't sign a contract till they're 18, but yeah. we're going to let them opt into medical care that's going to forever change their body and their body mm -hmm. chemistry. Without parents' uh, Without knowledge. parents' consent. Consent yeah. or knowledge. So it's, <clears throat> it's obviously a whole space of consideration and, 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 and dialogue, but it's also, and I say this with great respect for people who think they'll be happier living the life of a different gender. Okay. It I don't think be. they can biologically become a different gender, but think they'll be happier in, in trying to be, be that gender. Okay. I, I think I say it with great respect for their angst, but I'm hopeful that where we've gone with this as a country is also something of a kind of a tragic fad because I, I, mm -hmm. I can't there. A lot of issues that, that spin so what around you're saying, culture. What you're saying is there are people who are, are in pain or uh, unsure or whatever, but now we're making it trendy so more people should feel that way. Oh, there, there's, there's no – I mean, the numbers just exploded once we began to do the coaching and counseling and pushing and, and you mm. know, accommodating – 
some confusion and some some mixed emotions about your confidence and your gender is one thing, but encouraging is is something completely right. completely different. It. Completely encouraging different. your uncertainty. Yeah, completely in, in people who story. never had uncertainty about it, especially young people. They don't know. They yeah. don't know. Yeah, it's it, to most so many issues, Doctor Bob, that that spin around culture. There, they they can look a little different when you view them through a, a context of faith versus versus nature. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a man of faith. I grew up in a Christian home and, mm -hmm. I, and I believe that, you know, life is God's miracle. And, and, but if you, if you view the issue through, through the, the, the nature scope and, and evolution and, and, you know, no matter either way you view it, it's, there's, it's, it's hard to debate the notion that there's two genders that are very distinctly different and it's 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 throughout the animal kingdom. It's throughout it's throughout nature and science in the world. And so, it's it's odd to me that we've gone to such an extreme place with this particular issue. And I don't I don't know what the motivation is for it, but I think the consequences and the stakes for children who will be adults someday are dramatically high. I, I think, I mean, this is an issue for everybody to be smart about, not emotional about, because these are kids we're talking about, and they're going to do things that are irreversible. And, you know, what they do with their parents' guidance, you know, I can have mixed emotions about that, and I do. I mean, there's some things we don't allow parents to do with their kids, and we can have a conversation about whether some of this should be allowed with a par parent encouraging their own kid. But for the public square, for the school districts, for where there's so much influence to be part of this, to me, is, is borders on criminal. And you see how pernicious it is when even a mild law, the Florida law, basically prohibits schools, public schools, maybe private schools, prohibits schools from discussing sexuality in K through 3. K through three. Mm -hmm. It's not K through 12, mm -hmm. K through three. And the pushback against that law, even by corporations like Disney, is, is, is just exasperating. Yeah. How would you disagree that with that law? You, you want teachers, you want a school system to bring up sexuality in K through three? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, uh, I, you know, they started sex education. I remember, you know, maybe in the eighth grade, something like that. That's maybe about what ninth, I remember right? too. Right, eighth grade, yeah, maybe. That's about you what know, I remember. You know, when boys, is, you know, by the eighth grade, you're you're thirteen, fourteen, yeah. and that's when you know the testosterone starts flowing, and that's when women, uh, most girls, have their period or something. That's a right time to talk about it, right? Yeah. But not before then. Why would you even bring it up before then? Yeah, you're, you're taking your parents have to be able to make decisions about when their kids get exposed to different things that are not reading, writing and arithmetic and right. and social studies and so forth. I mean, conventional learning that that's that's in this parenting place and that's where it should that's stay. That's what parents job is sure. to do that. Sure. And then we have the extreme of uh, trans men. It's gone so far that men who claim they're women can now compete in women's sports and of course, most of those sports they're going to win, yeah. Because of the body mass and the and the muscles that men have, even before they they uh, went through an operation or 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 changed their hormone level. And I don't understand why the national organizations are accepting this. It is it is the death of women's sports. How is a natural woman going to beat? a man who claims he's a woman. And you see this guy who won the uh, uh, the gold medal or whatever in swimming. He has shoulders out to here, right? And that's you need shoulders to, to be a good swimmer. And he was a moderate to, uh, he was a moderate swimmer and never won against men. And then he suddenly says he's a woman and now it's accepted and he wins the prize. It's so demotivating to women. Now I think if you're a trans, we should have a separate class like we had. Why did it come about that we have men's sports and women's sports uh, in competition? Right. It's because men are different than women. The, their bodies are different, okay? And it would be unfair. So we should have a trans sport. That would be okay with me. I'm okay with that. But I'm not okay 
with people selecting what what gender they are so they can compete and win. Yeah, and I, I think, I haven't seen the polling on this, but there's a lot of angst about this, and there's a lot of angst with parents about this. And, and I'm not surprised. I'm surprised that... I'm surprised at the people who who are surprised at the angst, frankly, because you could have seen this going there. And and this is where we we cross over to um, interacting with people who have chosen to, you know, try to to uh, change their gender and and, and get comfortable in a different gender or, or, or becoming that gender. And and obviously you know, we're, we're, we're a gracious nation and we're, and we're thoughtful with everybody. And we accept it. You don't make fun of, of it. Okay. No, if that's what you want to be, it's okay with me. But it's how much are, do we ask conventional society with rules and, and bylaws and whatnot that's been in place for, for centuries to change, to accommodate that in a way that there's no trade off for them at all for the changes that they've made. Right, right. And There's that, no cost. Yeah, and that I think is where you're going to see parents of female athletes. I mean, you're seeing a lot of angst in that community. And I, I, that to me is quite natural for that kind of a reaction. Well, it, but the governing boards of those sports, there's something that, that happened overnight where they accept that, where they yeah. accept it, and they didn't push back and say, no, it's not fair to, to, a, to a biological woman. I, I, I don't get uh, how that happened. And has the left or the woke gotten that involved and ingrained in the fabric of our society that they control even those organizations? I governing think the, bodies? So I think the media has jumped in pretty hard on this issue, broadly speaking. I think the corporate world has jumped in pretty hard on this issue. And there is this sort of race to be woke mm -hmm. uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in sort of the institutional world, if you will. And I'm, again, I'm not sure if that's a fad or, or where that mm. ends up. But we're in a place with it right now where people who raise their voice, parents of a female athlete in high school sports and, and, and college sports and everything else, you raise your voice and you're somehow transphobic. And that to uh -huh. me is just fundamentally wrong. Yeah. That's, that's and you're taking penalized. away. You're, you're penalized. You're, you're probably penalized. going to be de yes. and And you're in the intent is to shame you. Shame and so you, yeah. then you start questioning your own, well, well, well maybe I'm, maybe I'm not woke enough or I'm not <laughs> thinking about the, thinking this through. No, you've thought it through and you've concluded mm -hmm. that a biological male should not be able to compete in women's sports. That's, <laughs> I mean, so, so there, there, and that's where the media has kind of jumped in and the social media has jumped in and they work so hard at taking Together. people's voice away. Right. And I think that's unfortunate. I think it's sad. And, and I'm not so sure, and I'm not so sure that a lot of people who define themselves as trans likely would be in favor of that kind of angst with those, with those parents and others. I, Cause I'm not sure how many trans athletes there are. Right. So again, it's, it's right. probably a small group of, of, of their uh, folks and, and that, that are, that are experiencing that. And I'm not even sure how many of them would think that would point that way. And, and, and um, Jenner is a perfect example of this. If I'm not mistaken, she believes that there should not be biological crossover in sports. For, for lack for for uh, layman's who, way of who putting said it. that who uh, uh, Caitlyn Jenner oh Caitlyn Jenner yeah. right yeah right. and and there right. should not be a biological crossover that's my layman's way of putting right. a biological crossover okay sure. in sports and I pre I'm pretty sure she's been fairly vocal about mm -hmm. it and of course she grew up in that world yeah right and so and and so I think her perspective is important and so I don't know where this ends up yet but it's certainly mm. it's certainly in an interesting place now and I and and a lot of it is is I suspect maybe lifetime um, academia driven, you know, the people who never leave the college campus and, 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 and in time sort of the whole picture becomes their, their mad little workshop. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know whether they're bored or I just know in, in my college experience, my best professors were people who had real life experience mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. ones who lived their whole life on campuses. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me they were just bored with it all and maybe looking for new avenues to, to take their brilliance. And maybe this is part of the university mix that they've become administrators now and they're they're looking for social engineering of some kind uh that's purely speculative by the yeah. way but it, yeah. but who knows 
But the media is certainly controlling the discussion on these things. And, uh, sure. It, uh, yeah. And it, it's not only about sexuality, of course, when it came to uh, COVID and masks. If, if anybody or any, any physician said masks really are worthless, immediately they were closed down on, on Twitter for misinformation. Yeah. Misinformation. Yeah, balanced and, media is, is, is probably our nation's greatest challenge right now. If you're looking forward on a, a, a decade's right. basis, not Freedom a year's of basis. Speech. Freedom, Freedom of speech. Speech, speech, direction of media. Uh, thankfully, the the hurdles to new media outlets have been lowered by social media, mm-hmm. right? So somebody can start their YouTube channel as long as YouTube will carry them, and you know, and and so there's there's but people YouTube can won't. write people YouTube can, won't. I mean, uh, I know. I'm, I'm, yeah, you, know, and, you, you but probably people walk write, pra- Prager University. There are certain uh, uh, issues or um, uh, episodes of Prager University that have been blocked. They, they block. Yeah, remarkable. Right. I, I, yeah. Right. So that that that. Somewhere, I hope we find normalcy with that as well. The, the but we're going in. The, we're not going in the right direction with this newly launched uh, disinformation governance board. Yeah, right. That uh, uh, Biden announced, and it's going to be part of uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. And what does that mean? The, what is their job? The disinformation government board. They're going to decide what is disinformation. Yeah. And if it's disinformation, they're going to claim that it's harmful and therefore can be censored, right? So freedom of speech is going away. They, the left is trying to do away with freedom of speech, and they're going to do it because we all know there are limits to freedom of speech. You can't be in a theater and yell fire because it could cause harm to people, yeah. right? You can't incite people to violence, right. uh, I think, under freedom of speech. So there are certain very narrow limits. But now they're going to claim that if you say the COVID vaccine doesn't work, Oh, you're risking people's lives because if you say that people may believe it and not take the uh, vaccine and therefore die, therefore you can't say that. So putting the government in charge of what is disinformation is extremely dangerous. It's a it's right out of 1984, out of the book, George Orwell's famous Mm -hmm. book, 1984, uh, where, where they had a Department of Truth and where they determined what is truth. So this, the good news is it will not survive a Republican majority. That's the good news. This, to me, is a stunning development. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm stunned. It won't survive a majority. I, I don't think where? it would survive a, a Republican majority in, 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 in its in, existence. Just in the House? Yeah. Well, it might take the House and Senate. But I, but I think between the ability to call hearings and to hold the administration's feet to the fire and to and and to sort of lift the veil on this, I don't think it would survive a Republican majority. I'm hopeful that it would not. That I'm I'm I should not be surprised by this and the and the and the way this has come about in the last couple of weeks. I, I, I suppose I should not be surprised, and yet I am. I'm surprised that they've come forward with this in such a direct way, with such a buffoonish, proven mm-hmm. leftist with such problematic rhetoric in her past that is going to head this thing okay Mm -hmm. that they are this brazen it shouldn't surprise me and yet i am a little bit stunned and and i'm not sure who's in the driver's seat of this administration but i don't think this is going to survive the next couple of years because all and and whatever tests come on this down the road they won't survive this court they shouldn't survive this court they shouldn't su- sur- survive a court of nine liberal justices but yes, they but, might but but look how long it takes to adjudicate these things through the through the uh, judicial process mm-hmm. and meanwhile they'll be shutting people down and saying no you are now uh, that's hate speech and that's not allowed they they may well right I, I, they may <clears throat> well it is deeply troubling to me deeply troubling yeah. And what's and I think it's going to survive because young people today, and I've seen various uh, YouTube videos where people are going around and asking them, and they say hate speech shouldn't be allowed. Mm. Hate speech shouldn't be allowed. That's exactly why we have freedom of speech. It's not so you can say the, si- the that it's a sunny day when it's a sunny day. Yeah, we have freedom of speech, so you can say outlandish things. Outlandish things doesn't matter if it's true, not true. You yeah. have the right to say it. And now the the current generation of young people have been taught that if you hurt somebody's feelings, it's wrong and you shouldn't say it. And then. Whose feelings are we going to measure it by? Yeah. 
By, by the way, I fundamentally agree that it's not right to 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 hurt somebody's feelings at at the baseline level. But the but the issue is in our country. You're you're allowed to hurt somebody's feelings. It, you're you're it, what you're not allowed to do is go out of your way to physically harm somebody or, or right. to incite violence against them and, and right. various things and so forth. I'm young people have a tendency. Our campaign is so full of young people. We have so many twenty somethings. You you'll get a kick out of watching our uh, campaign unfold in full. Right now we're in primary mode, but in mm -hmm. full in the next mm -hmm. few months, Doctor Bob, and it's so full of young people. And what you notice with young people is their immediate answer on things comes from the heart quite quickly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from mm -hmm. the head. Okay, and that's a credit to them mm -hmm. and their upbringing and mm -hmm. and whatnot. Right, but then when you get behind it a little bit and engage their their brain. And give them a couple of examples mm -hmm. of what could be considered hate speech and mm -hmm. not hate speech. They sing a different tune. Young people today, there's a little libertarian streak in them. We do a lot of door knocking. Oh. And when you door knock, you talk to a lot of high school kids. They step out on the porch. We, we, we tell our team we never cross the threshold, right? So you're invited in an 80-year-old woman's house for a glass of cold water. We just don't touch oh, the, don't, We don't cross yeah. the threshold, Good period, idea. right? So high schools are step out, take a little break from their homework and, and, and talk to people. And what you'll find when you talk to them is they got a little bit of libertarian streak in them. They, they don't want a lot of government as long as they understand what government government is right mm -hmm. and and that's a little bit refreshing I, th I think our young people are more cons I guess my point is I think our young people today are more conservative than they realize well and that I, gives I, me there hope. is hope and uh, that there's an organization yeah. uh, run by Charlie Kirk I don't know if you know Turning Point USA sure 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 that is yeah. making great inroads mm -hmm. in high schools and college campuses yeah I just hope it's not too late and I you know I'm a big supporter of Charlie well I believe I believe, and this is, I don't know this is gonna, how many years this is going to take, and we have a few of the Turning Point kids out of San Diego State, they're part of our campaign. We have an amazing, she runs Turning Point for the San Diego chapter, San Diego State chapter now. She was one of our community liaisons in Encinitas, Chiara, she's fantastic. I mean, so they, they, they have been kind of enlightened a little bit, and Charlie's doing great work. I think someday young people on college campuses are going to realize that following this hard left ideology blindly, on college campuses is the exact opposite of what college kids historically do, mm -hmm. which is to reject authority a little mm -hmm. bit, question authority a little bit, mm -hmm. push back. I don't know how it's going to happen mm -hmm. exactly, but republicanism and, and conservatism and libertarian leanings, we're going to make it sexy. It, 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 it's at some point, for lack of a better way to put it, I'm putting I it like that way, it. right? And, 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 well, I and remember Charlie kids, talked to an audience. I was there, and he says, you are now the radicals. It, we, that's it. That's right. a better way to put right. it. Absolutely, you are now better the way radicals. to put it. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and that could be a little bit refreshing. And, and how long it takes to get there. But we've gone to an extreme on college campuses, too. You hear about kids who want to write a paper, you know, on something, and they don't write it because they're afraid of a grade. They 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 risk speaking up in class. They risk the teacher's wrath, or you know, behind the scenes, are they going to get a yeah. B on a paper that yeah. they would have gotten an A on otherwise? And that's just flat wrong. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, you don't know how much of that is going on. But you hear quite a few stories from both students and parents. Mm -hmm. Troubling. Yep. If we lose freedom of speech, we've lost America. Absolutely it's right. Right. It, it is the single thing. There, there are two speech things. is an expression of thought, and if they're going to control your speech, the they are controlling your thought. That's what's going to happen. Right. It's it, it's, and 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 every if if that entity were allowed to stand yeah. and 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 remain in right. existence in the DOJ, one administration to the next, the definition of hate speech or speech or unacceptable speech, whatever it looks right. like, right. whatever you define it as, disinformation is going disinformation is going to change from administration to administration naturally yep. it's just impractical it's wrong it's wrong for our country it I, I believe it will be challenged in court what the case will look like i don't know but it's disconcerting to me that we have an administration that thought that this it's is going idea. to be broadly acceptable to our country right. that's what concerns me the most right that's right, that they thought and they, they still think that it's mm -hmm. going to be accepted. <clears throat> well, your comment that uh, Congress, uh, it won't stand, and I'm going to take issue with that. I remember um, when Lois Lerner, this was under uh, Obama, she mm -hmm. was head of the uh, IRS. Sure. And the IRS became uh, weaponized uh, by Obama and wasn't giving 501c3 status, that's uh, charitable status, to any right-wing, organ any conservative organization. Mm -hmm. It was just sitting on the paperwork. Mm-hmm. And I remember Daryl Issa, your colleague, 
future colleague, your Thank friend. You appreciate the confidence. Yeah, yeah, sure. Grilling her. Mm-hmm. And she was cool as can be. And he asked tough questions, and she either refused to answer them or was evasive. And I talked to Daryl. He came back to, 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 to his district, and mm-hmm. he's a friend of mine, or over dinner. I said, uh, Daryl, I, I, I was so frustrated watching you do that, uh, trying to get to the facts. You were clearly, it, it was embarrassing to her, but she didn't care. She, she didn't act embarrassed. She doesn't care. Yeah. And I said, Daryl, could you suspend her? Could you cut her pay uh, until she answers? No. Right. Uh, could you get her fired? No. Yeah. So I'm really concerned that Congress, and you, you know, God willing, you'll win and you'll try to do things, but Congress doesn't have a lot of Has power. Has limitations. Right. Yeah. You can hold hearings. Yeah. And, 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 and so, so we have a lot of conversations with conservatives who wonder why this doesn't get prosecuted, that doesn't get prosecuted. Why isn't this... Why aren't people made aware of this, made aware of that, right? Sake of time, I'll skip all the examples. And what I tell them is generally you need one of the two Ps, okay? You need a prosecutor, a willing prosecutor, mm-hmm. or you need the press. Mm-hmm. Okay? I see. Yeah, to make something. Yeah. yeah. That's and, very good. And, and the, <clears throat> the conventional mainstream press, it would appear that we've lost a little bit. We've, they've lost objectivity. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that limits. No, they're a, they're yeah. a mouthpiece for the left. Yeah. It, it, it's in varying degrees, but broadly speaking, you're right. And then the, the the prosecutors, so many of them in varying roles now have become so political mm-hmm. that that you wonder there can you you know what's going to be right there. So uh, it's 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 hard to know what hope there is for some of these things because the progressive movement, the hard left is so substantially playing for keeps. Mm -hmm. They want to fundamentally change the country. I remember Obama saying that. They are on offense, Dr. Bob. Mm -hmm. And so, and so the tactics, the, the, what, what is, what is right? What is fundamentally wrong? What all of that I think is, is cast aside. And I do believe the Obama administration is the first administration in my lifetime that I have seen use the levers of power Mm -hmm. So blatantly political. Yes. Okay. Yes. And 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 that and and you know it was the gun scandal. It was the IRS scandals. I mean, these were things where mm-hmm. the levers of power were used very politically, and um, and it's going on in California. We have people who will not donate because they have some connection of business to the state. And it's been made clear to them mm. by various agencies in the state. Oh, I didn't know this. This is something. Oh, new. yes. That if you donate to my oh, uh, yes. uh, opponent, you're not. I can going tell to... you some remarkable stories a- about what con- uh, documented Republican donors, people who have developed that reputation, yeah. what they have heard from people with power in in the state apparatus. And he- it's particularly problematic in healthcare because because of the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. So much now of the healthcare in California is part of the exchange network, which California is running like you and I ran businesses, right? To grow and, and, and all of this, right? It's not enough to, they're, they're looking to develop market share. So they're very, very ambitious about it. And, and you know, that's, I don't know that it's a first for our country, but we're going down a path now where the hard left is operating as though the ends justify the means. That's and right. you look at anything in history, Dr. Mm-hmm. Bob, and when powerful, influential people think that way, There's that no they're end. so right about their way that the end justifies the means, that is never a good thing. And it's never a fair and just thing. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that goes directly into uh, the law in California. I don't know, perhaps you know when it was passed. Uh, but uh, the law changing the definition of larceny uh, or um, uh, a felony and making it a misdemeanor if you shoplift or steal. I don't know if it's only shoplifting or if you ha- hold up a person. I don't know if, the, if it applies uh, to a person also. But $950 or less is now a misdemeanor in California. I don't know when that law was passed. Yeah, I would say about six or seven years ago. I dealt with it as a mayor and council member. Yep. Our law enforcement community has dealt with it. It is fueling uh, the lifestyle, and there's two pieces to it, um, of, of our, our homeless population. 
which is not great in San Diego County. It's mm-hmm. second from the bottom for a county or city its size in Orange County. It is remarkable how bad we've gotten with the homeless issue in, in both counties. It is fueled by Prop 47 because it's a two-part ballot question. It was reduced. It was lifting that limit to 950. Mm-hmm. Okay? Where, where, what was it? Do you know? Was it $100, $50? Uh, before I think it was 150 150 I think it was 150 right. and, um, and then it took tier one narcotics and moved them to Mr. My, misdemeanors. <sighs> So, well, and, and this is, and this part. is where this is, this has cost human life. In my first year as mayor, we had a 21 and 28 year old die in my city. It broke my heart. Now they weren't San Juan Capistrano kids, but it didn't matter where they came from. It, these were, these were kids to, in my, in my eyes, these are kids, right? Uh, the, 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 when we, when we took, took the tier one narcotics down to misdemeanors, we effectively created a lifestyle Mm-hmm. That said, you can be homeless. You can feed if you if you're not getting assistance or something. You can do the shoplifting thing. You can do do what you have to do. You know, property crimes have exploded in both counties to 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 get what you need. The drugs became dirt cheap. Okay, mm. we, we have we, we have a supply issue with narcotics. We don't just have a demand issue. Mm. We have a supply. We are being flooded, flooded mm-hmm. with with fentanyl, and, and that and that's a supply. So we have a demand issue too, but. So we created a situation where we, we, we can't wrap our arms around people anymore. We, we can't, you know, I've had parents tell me 30 days detoxing their, their kid's body and then the choice between six months in jail or six months in a drug treatment program saved their life. Yes, I understand. Okay. Politicians don't want to go down that route because tough love doesn't pull well, mm-hmm. but we are sitting and watching homeless people commit suicide and somehow feeling because we're throwing a bunch of money at it at the federal level, we're doing something about it. Prop 47, this it's possible our state will never recover from Prop 47. Two years ago, they tried a ballot question to just bring it back to 350 and they didn't touch the drug piece, right? And I don't think it passed and the name got changed and you know, the, at some level, that game, the ballot question game is a little bit rigged in California because you can't hold the name you want. You got the attorney general changing oh, the names. You I know what see. they called Prop 47? No. Because they were going to save money from incarceration and make schools safer. Oh, it's, and, oh, oh, it's The for Safe school. Neighborhood in Schools Act. That's safe they called neighborhood. It. So I now see. you go into Walgreens, you steal 800, you walk out, nobody's going to stop you because corporate management has told them not to try and stop people. Right. And, and, and they're fueling a lifestyle. Property crimes, uh, by the way, to your point about holding somebody up, it doesn't exempt the other piece of it. So if you stick a gun in somebody's face and say, give me your $800 watch, that's still a separate crime. Oh, the it use, is. Yeah, the use, of a, the use of force in a commission of a crime. Um, but you can, you, can, you, can steal a, you can steal a power saw from your neighbor. I see. Right? So, this, see. You know, so, so it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's left law enforcement very frustrated, but sadly it has left people who are either mm. bone sick with addiction or, or sick with untreated or un, undiagnosed mental illness literally dying in the streets. You know, two people, two homeless people die a day in San Francisco today. Mm-hmm. I'm fond of saying Gavin Newsom's never run anything except San Francisco into the ground, mm-hmm. and now he's running our state, and he's doing our best, his best to run our state into the ground. So Prop 47, unfortunately, may be here to stay, but wow. every time Mike Levin and the progressives have something they can do to counter it a little bit, they don't. So vote in Congress a couple of weeks ago yeah. to move fentanyl up into Tier 1, okay, Kids are not dying of heroin overdoses and, and mm-hmm. cocaine overdoses right now in college campuses and, and in our high schools mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. our middle schools, sometimes tragically. They're dying of fentanyl because this stuff is getting laced with fentanyl. Okay, Mike Levin and the, progressive, the, the progressives could have got this done. With their vote, it would have got done. That whole 108-member caucus. All they had to do is move fentanyl up into a tier one to at least give law enforcement some relief and our kids wow. and parents some chance. And they refused to hear the Republican amendment to do it. They were happy to move cannabis off tier one. Yeah. I don't think that'll pass the Senate, but that's a different discussion. But they 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 voted not to hear the Republican amendment to move fentanyl into, into phase one, into level one. So if you are a drug dealer, your penalty for dealing fentanyl. cocaine yes. is harsher than your penalty for dealing fentanyl, even though fentanyl is probably 500 times more toxic and dangerous than cocaine. The progressive movement in California and in this state yep. does not want to incarcerate people. I can't, I can't 
understand why. I can't I can't get behind their heads on it. I don't know I don't know where their hearts at on it, but we're losing we're losing kids. And it happened on my son's campus, 14-year-old kid. You, 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 you talk to five people in this neighborhood, you mm-hmm. know one of the five has a personal experience with it. I just about guarantee you. That's how overwhelming the issue has become. And I know we've strayed a little bit off Prop 47. No, no, but it's, but that's fine. It, I'm fond of saying that the progressive movement is decriminalizing crime. Everything. Decriminalizing yeah. crime. And, and to be clear, I'm not talking about conventional Democrats. I'm talking about the progressive movement. It's but 108 that's members the party plus Bernie now. Sanders. That's I know. leading the party. I know. I know. And it's capturing the media's, you know, uh, well, I too. Why? Is, is crime a white thing? You know, uh, the definition is... I, I don't know what the... You know, what's the rationale? They, they, well, I think if you, talk, if you talk about criminal justice reform, then, then now you're lumping that into the conversation and everything else. I don't know. I know they illegalized private prisons in California with no idea where they were going to put people. Mm -hmm. Then they released 20,000 under under the guise of, you know, COVID control or whatever, right? They could, they couldn't keep them safe in a contained prison, right? So, (laughs) so, so they had to let them out. They had to let 20,000. China was putting everybody in prison. Remarkable. To say, to say. It's remarkable. So they just, they, they just, they're, uh, now we got these DAs that, that are all nuts. I mean, do you know 90% of DA Gascon's assistant DAs have signed on to the recall? 90% of his own have signed on to recall him. have signed on to support the recall. Wow. That's how, that's how atrocious he is. That's yeah. how selective he is with what he enforces. Well, we need, a new, uh, we need a new attorney general in California. And uh, yeah, I hope Nathan, uh, Nathan Hochberg. Uh, very sharp Hockman guy. Very sharp is, uh, guy. Very right. hardworking candidate. Hard-working, yeah. Raising good money, we'll I think. We'll be uh, yeah. talking to him. Great track record tomorrow as a night, prosecutor. Of oh, terrific. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've met him a couple of times. Yeah, I hope he has a chance. And I think given the, uh, given the uh, huge spirit, Spur in, a spurt in crime increase. Uh, even Democrats are going to have to vote for a Republican uh, who stands for uh, controlling crime. Oh, I, I think I think you're starting to see some real angst around it. It's property crimes. Watch your next door. And th- this is my this. So I've been part of next door for a year or two, or whatever. And what I is next door? It, it's next door is you loop into your next door app for your community, oh. and everybody chats. Oh, and the rule. I think the rule is not supposed to be too political, but. And it used to be you would occasionally something see something crime related, and now it's daily. This guy is walking around doing this. Anybody know what the helicopter was last night? Um, this watch out for this guy. I heard he tried to, you know, he ran after some girl in this parking lot, and, and he, you see it almost daily. Oh, and so, this you, so you, you enter, you, you join next door it, somehow, and, and you'll see and, conversations in your neighborhood. Whether oh, you take you part type, in them or not, you type in your address or you type in yep. your zip code. Yep. Wow. Great. Yeah. I never heard of that. Yeah. And, and I think it's raising everybody's anxiety level because the property crimes, the proximity to crimes, yes. the the unpredictability of people who are sort of their spirits are broken as whether it's again, whether it's addiction or mental illness or, you know, we're doing an awful job for our homeless. We've layered government on top of each other. So so if you were to ask me you know, in hearing or something, well, who's responsible for the failure of taking care of the homeless population? I could do one of these, yeah, right? Yeah. When in building your successful business, did this ever work for anybody? No accountability. Yeah, yeah. We're layering government on top of government. And it would it might shock you to know and your viewers to know that if you take our counties and cities and state and federal government and lump it all together in San Diego and Orange County, adjust it for inflation and population, we're spending almost twice per person what we were spending 20 years ago and getting nothing but utter failure. Mm. And, and remember what Reagan said? Government is not the solution. Government is the problem. Mm-hmm. We're loading all this debt onto the backs of our kids. I mean, COVID, oh, $7 yeah, trillion, right, We can only right, account for $2 yeah, trillion, right? Yeah. Really, these kids are going to feel the impact. I mean, look at already interest rates have doubled under Biden. And that's I, I think the cat's out of the bag and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time now. And, and you could see 5 6% ten-year treasury note but now we now we got these kids dealing with all that debt and you like to think okay but back home their lives are this much better well no they're no, not no. you look at every statistic and measure of quality of life and and government is truly failing it's it's there is no accountability there's no business sense we've throughout it we're very firm supporters of term limits now there's downside for term limits okay and we've seen some of it in it's Sacramento rare. it's rare yeah but, occasionally you can have a superb individual who's filling a role and you'd right. love to you'd have that love person to have them stay. but it's right. rare it, I, yeah. you know i've thought it through i'm for term limits when yeah. you have people and i'm sorry uh, it's both sides of the aisle you have people like Mitch McConnell 
uh, who have been there so long, or Bernie Sanders, or you're looking at uh, 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 Joe Biden, who, who his entire adult life was in Congress, and you can't point to one accomplishment, we need term limits. If Wait, there's a term limit of being president, why shouldn't there be a term limit for other things? It, it's the career piece of it for me. Right. It's the idea that, like, I've had my money-making career, right? I, I, I chose to step away from the corporate world and spend the last working chapter of my life making some kind of difference, right? right. I don't know exactly what that would look like at the time, but that 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 was what I chose but to you're, do. You're you're making a sacrifice, as sure. as did President Trump. He was a highly successful billionaire, and uh, he could do anything he wanted in the world, and nobody cared about it, or they applauded him. Now he's hated, vilified. He lost a fortune. You know, half the country won't stay to anything with the Trump name on it. So he took a sacrifice, and the same thing you have done, you're doing now. You're, you're making a sacrifice. But these these uh, people in politics who've been there, they didn't go in uh, to make a sacrifice. They went directly from for whatever they were Career. For a career right. in politics, and that's exactly, yeah, it. and that is the exactly, exactly the problem. Yeah. They get re- they get in a constant a bubble, and they begin to forget what the issues look like through the eyes of everyday people. As a financial planner, I live the issues with with my clients. Right, I saw you know I saw them try to grow their businesses, have government in their way, try to take care of an elderly parent, and 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 you know and some distress from that, going through job loss, going through divorce, everything else. When you start to lose touch with what these things mean to everyday people at the kitchen table and when they're driving in their car and their worries are on their minds, that's when you shouldn't be making laws and rules and being part of it. The example I use is back to the state for a moment because it's such a clear example of bad government and, 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 and a political person in, in what should be more of a chief executive role. I come back to Governor Newsom. Governor Newsom had a chance weeks and months ago, so did the legislature, to wave a wand and reduce the price of gas in California by about a buck twenty. I see. Okay? By, by lowering the tax. Right. Immediate tax holiday. Just California tax. We got this $60, 70 billion dollar de- uh, uh, surplus. Surplus. He brags about right. Yeah. Most of it, by the way, which came out of the federal COVID spigot. But that's another. Yeah. That's another thing. But you had a chance to impact things immediately for people. The next day, mm-hmm. just gas is cheaper. They don't necessarily know why. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. No, they he could make political resist, hay right, out of it. They even. could not resist the temptation for them to wait. And now, if you if you watch the headlines, it's going to be about October. It's going to be a check or a debit card oh, from Uncle oh, Gavin, oh, and oh. that is that is disgustingly political because yeah. people have got have to heat their homes. They have to get to work. And most people are living on fixed salary. That's it. They and make so a the certain first, amount of money, and that doesn't change. Right. And so the first for somebody of modest middle income. The first thing to go when their non-discretionary costs explode mm-hmm. is their savings plans. Mm-hmm. The 529, they're, they're, you know, so little Johnny doesn't get overwhelmed by debt when he goes to college. The extra couple of percent they just added to their 401k mm-hmm. last quarterly away. time, they, want, they, they call they HR and they say, hey, I want to suspend my 401k or can I borrow from my 401k? Mm-hmm. The first thing that goes is where they can almost least afford because, future. That, because it's going to hurt their future peace right. of mind. Immediate impact. Governor Newsom is a 100% politician. Biden is a 100% politician. Mike Levin, my opponent, is a 100% politician. And, and, and that's the mindset that's got everything screwed up. It's, it's, it's got to be government from the ground up. You start with the people, everyday life, where they're trying to go, where they're trying to get peace of mind. You look at good governance, right? Smart governance, business-minded governance, holding people accountable. I think when in your campaign, look, I'm not a <clears throat> marketing strategist, right. but you should stress that you are giving up your career as a financial planner that made a lot of money, and you are now, uh, you are now going to help society. And it's not the other way around, right? That uh, and, and I don't know what Levin's background is, but probably he's been a career. He's been in politics most of his life. That's my guess. Uh, environmental lawyer who never fought a case on behalf of the environment in his life. He was basically. basically a lawyer for two years doing bankruptcy work for large banks, and then he, he became lobbyist slash government relations for yeah, a couple okay. of dollars share hydropower. So he's doing it for money. You're doing it to save the country. That's what it sounds like to me. Well, I'm, I'm doing it to make it have as much impact right. as I can mm-hmm. and to contribute to saving the country. That's, that's, as, that's as, as, um, 
as shiny as I want to get with the descriptive, you know, and, okay. and but okay. but I, I'm doing it to have as much impact as I can. Yeah, in that regard, what can Congress do? What will you do if uh, when you win a seat uh, about the borders and in this amnesty for uh, for uh, people who are crossing the border illegally and and the fact that California won't even let the the police or the sheriff's department notify uh, the uh, uh, Customs and Immigration uh, 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 Police when they're releasing somebody from jail who should be then deported yeah you know what can congress do and what do you think so with, with the republican majority of course we can immediately take steps to secure the border hold the administration's feet to the fire and we will we, we have to have a safe secure manageable border for everyone's benefit and, and people on both sides of the business i mean people drowning in the rio grand river mothers from these broken countries south of us putting their daughters on birth control because they expect them to get raped right trying to get i've up. heard the story none of that is healthy we should be ashamed of it i warned about it when we threw the flag up as a state to call ourselves a sanctuary state i said this is disingenuous <laughs> to tease people up here and say fight and scratch and claw your way to get here and you'll find sanctuary that was very very disingenuous three or four years ago but Americans will not accept any kind of immigration reform to the extent that we need it. You could argue that 70% of what we need is already is already in the laws. We just need to enforce them. There are some things that are a little out of whack and a little archaic about some of the ground rules for people trying to come here and do it the right way. Worker visas, industry need. There are some things that that we can enhance. And then we have some some circ I've worked with some families that have paid into Social Security, and I mean tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Their status is they're legal but their status is kind of quasi legal and so they don't right now if they turn 62 they're not eligible for social security even though they've been paying into a decade so there's a lot of stuff like that that has to get sorted out sure. right that's, we're a very gracious nation but that's we've, on the fringe. we've always we've that's always on the fringe. sure we've always wrapped our arms around people we've always asked that you just do it the right way mm -hmm. okay that's all we've ever asked i had on my dad's side we got a guy who came on the mayflower the only guy to fall off the mayflower true story my mom's side i guess it'd be about 100 years ago the Tarnowski's from Poland, right? And they did everything the right way, okay? And fought through, you know, I mean, really fought through the depression and all. And, and so, but people, all we've ever asked to people is you do it the right way, right? And that's, 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 that's dissipated because the progressive movement wants open borders. They mm -hmm. want the European Open Border Society. They want more Democrats. Well, that, that, that might be all or part of it, but here's the, here's the thing that just, they, people have to understand. As if you look at it through a business person's eyes, we can't open our borders. It, we, we just f fundamentally can't do it. Functionally, excuse me, we can't do it. Not everybody wants to be in Germany with open borders. Everybody wants to be in the United States, okay? How can you say, we're going to give you a promise of the American dream, unlimited, uncapped opportunity, mm -hmm. Now, if they don't manage to change that, right? Yeah. But if you miss, you'll get a social safety net that's better than the quality of life you left behind working 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. How do, you, how do you lay that out there? Yeah. So you either dramatically change benefits for everybody, including people who worked for 15 years and are in hard times now, mm -hmm. and they're collecting a benefit for some reason mm -hmm. or another. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you hold that equation up as mm -hmm. a, as a, if you look at it like a business? So people have to understand we cannot open our borders. So if we don't open our borders, that means we have to be able to manage them and keep them closed and manageable. And then you know we, we open them to enough people done the right way. Americans will never accept this and any meaningful change around it, like a pathway for this group or anything else, unless we prove that we can secure that border. Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes, barriers, technology, properly funded ICE. Other countries do it. It's sure. doable. Sure. It's and doable. And it's not cruel. It's necessary. Yeah. We, we, we are by far the most generous, benevolent country and generous country, generous country right. no matter how you measure it. Yeah, but the right? left, see, the left's goal is the destruction of democracy. That's the left's goal, destruction of the free enterprise system and democracy. That's their goal. And uh, uh, I hope when you're in Congress, you, you recognize that. And my fear is that we're going to, uh, the Republicans will take the House, maybe the Senate, and then they'll reach across the aisle to, to try to make uh, compromises. 
It's a mistake. So, so can I the take, left yeah. doesn't reach across the aisle. Oh, no. No, they vilify across the aisle. Right. It's gotten there. Well, well, we have to do similar things. We have to, once we're in control, we have to take control. The problem with George W. Bush, we, he had the House, the Senate, and the White House. And we didn't close the Department of Education. We didn't close the Department of Energy. We didn't close the or cut back of the Environmental Protection Agency. All of these are bloated organizations. And that's my problem with conservatives. They mm -hmm. get in power and they want to be nice. Yeah. It's past time to be nice. Well, I, here, here's what I think. When, when we get in power, the progressive movement... And for the lack of a better way to put it, all these knuckleheads associated with it, those who were still in office, okay, Mike won't, Levin won't be, but those who are still in office as progressives, they have to be set aside. They're not serious policymakers. They're not serious policymakers. They're destroyers. They're, they're destroyers. They're flamethrowers. They're out to grow their Twitter audience, not to get serious business done, okay? And they just have to be set aside, marginalized and set aside, okay? And then serious people who want to get things done on, on the handful. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a long list. I think there's a handful of things that we have to work on a, a, in our country. Chief amongst them, by the way, is getting our fiscal house in order. I mean, this is, we uh, mark my words, we're going to lose our credit rating someday. They, they, you know, they say it can never happen. They said that about Great Britain and it happened in the seventies. That country's never been the same. It, the basic economics is the same no matter where you look at you it. You can't and this, keep on printing money and assume nothing's going to happen. Printing and borrowing. Printing and borrowing. And and here's the absurdity. Okay, no matter what you think, Doctor Bob, of what what we spent during COVID. Okay, I I think eighty percent of it was nuts wasted. in the spending, wasted. But no matter what you think of that, just accept that we spent it and we came through a storm of some of some definition. Can you imagine in a household? You go through some storm. One of you loses your job or there's a, you know, a, a layoff or a chronic health condition or something. Right? You come through this storm where you sort of just get by for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then you sit down at the kitchen table and you say, geez, honey, well, we got through that. You know, thank goodness. You know, let's go and borrow a bunch of money and buy a bunch of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what these progressives are trying to do with the three and a half trillion. Thank goodness got put on hold by Manchin. Mm -hmm. OK, one man. One man, yeah, a Democrat that we had to rely on. Right. Can and you if, imagine that? So yeah. here's a good example where one man can yeah. make a dis difference. But can you imagine, I, I agree, but can you imagine a household or a business ever operating that way? Well, in the corporate world, we all knew the, there was times you spent for necessary and times you were able to spend for nice. But you always knew when you had to spend for nice necessary. I lived through the mortgage crisis with two major Wall Street firms, okay? And when the dust settled on it, Everything was cut across the board. You made deep cuts. I mean, right. into the marrow and, and, right. and the bone. I mean, it really, right. it, it, you just, you, it, it, it was something you had to do. To survive. Right. When you, we, we came the through the The government COVID. has never had a layoff. Right? That's probably so. Yeah, I'm sure I, that's so. I don't yeah. know of any example yeah. where even a state government had a layoff, but certainly the federal government in my not, in my lifetime have never had a you, layoff. You may well be right. There was the mass firing on the tra air traffic controllers. That's a different Reagan. story. Reagan yeah. did a great yeah. job. Yeah, but they, but I think you might be right about the layoffs thing. I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if you're right. Remember when President Trump sadly, had to brag about reducing the time it took to dismiss somebody out of the VA from 18 months to six months with the VA Accountability Act. Yep. I mean, we had men and women who served our country die on waiting lists. Yep. And you know, for that Arizona example, there were other examples of that course. never made the light of day. Of course. And, and, and that's, that's government without accountability. And by the way, all the improvements we've made to the VA under President Trump are being undone by this administration and tolerated by the progressive movement, Mike doesn't, Levin included. Doesn't, surpri doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it, it's 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 very very sad. Well, it's because people are getting hurt. You know, I'm uh, I'm not optimistic about uh, where it, uh, the country is going, but I want to thank you, Brian, for spending time with me today, and I want to thank you much much more for your willingness to run for Congress and take on the very difficult job of turning our country around from the cliff that it's heading towards today. Thanks again. My Ryan. pleasure. I really was, enjoyed um, the time with you. Great, great conversation yep. and good luck. Thank you, Dr. Congress. Bob. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed this episode of Life, Life Lessons with Dr. Bob, please subscribe and uh, then you'll automatically be notified of future podcasts in this series.
Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. If you enjoy these interviews with some of today's most influential thought leaders, please follow and rate the show on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, you can also watch each episode on YouTube as well. We'll see you next time.